going to be continuing on with analyzing the Fashion MNIST data set that we've been sort of playing with in the previous couple of videos where we really explored that data in the last video. In this video, what we're going to do is actually build the neural network. So we're going to build the model that's going to uh, analyze a given image from that data set and classify it as to what class it thinks it's in. So if it's a shirt, it, hopefully it will classify it correctly as being a shirt and etc. So what we're going to do is we're going to build that model using TensorFlow. So what we're going to do is the way that you construct that model in TensorFlow is very simple. You just construct the layers for the neural network that you want to uh, have this model be consisted of. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the plotting code that we had here from the previous video, just remove that. And I'm going to actually set up uh, an object, a model object, that's going to essentially be our neural network. And really the basic building block, if you're not familiar with how neural networks are constructed, is that they're constructed out of layers. So a layer is going to really extract the representation from the data uh, fed into them, and it's going to get something out of them. So hopefully these representations are going to be meaningful for the problem that we're dealing with. So generally, deep learning consists of chaining together a bunch of different layers, and each of these layers constitute the overall neural network. So this neural network that we're going to build is going to consist of three layers and I'll explain what each of these layers uh, actually do. So I'm just going to write them out first. So I'm going to set a variable called model and I'm going to say that this is equal to keras.sequential. So again this is what we imported uh, before, the keras module which is part of TensorFlow and keras.sequential is that we're, we're kind of constructing um, you know, a sequential series of layers for the neural network that we're going to build. So inside of this function, we're going to give it a list, and inside of that, we're going to give it each of the subsequent layers. So the first layer, we'll say keras.layers, layers, and then we'll say flatten. So I'm going to write this out first, and then I'm actually going to explain kind of what, what all of these things uh, are, are actually representing in the neural network. So maybe what I'll do is I'll just kind of explain them as I go. This is the first layer as part of our neural network. What this is doing is this is kind of flattening. Uh, it's the first layer that's going to flatten or transform the data that we have from a two-dimensional array to a one-dimensional array. It's kind of flattening out that data. So if you remember the array, uh, the first part of the array was the images, and they were a 28 by 28 um, essentially matrix that represented the pixel information for each of those images. What we're doing here is we want to kind of flatten that out into a one-dimensional vector. So instead of having all of these things be a matrix, we're just taking these things and kind of stacking them as one long chain, so one long vector. That's really what this is doing, and this is kind of um, you know pretty important for the way in which this is going to be fed into our neural network. So instead of having a 28 by 28 two-dimensional uh, representation of the data, we're having a one-dimensional uh, 28 times 28 or 784 uh, dimension vector. So this is really just kind of, you can think of this as unstacking the rows of pixels in the image and lining them up. Uh, so this layer doesn't really have any parameters to learn, it just only reformats the data that we give it. So that's not really a whole lot going on there. The next one is the second layer, so we'll say keras.layers.dense, and then we'll feed it 128, and then we'll give it an activation function of tf.nn.relu. So what is this? So this is the second layer of our neural network. Actually, the second and third are going to be dense layers. Um, so after we flatten out the pixels, the network is going to we're going to build the network in such a way that it consists of two dense layers. And these densely connected or fully connected neural layers, uh, both terms are synonymous, the first dense layer that we're building here is going to have 128 nodes. So that's what we're specifying with that first number 128. Uh, and the second one that we're going to construct, I'll just go ahead and construct that second one here, is going to be more or less the same thing. Only in this one, we're going to have 10 over here because we want essentially the output of this neural network, this last layer is going to be the output layer, and we want it to be uh, essentially a number from zero to nine. So we can only expect 10 neurons in this last layer. Uh, each of those are going to be a possible output for what our neural network is going to generate. And the activation function here is not going to be very low, but it, it will be a uh, soft max. So we'll say soft, I believe it's soft max. Yeah, soft max. So this is pretty typical for output layer in a neural network. So what we're going to do for that last layer, the second layer, it's a 10 node softmax layer. And basically, like I said, it just returns an array of 10 probability scores and that each of these scores must sum to one because um, in order for it to be a valid probability, that must be the case. And each node 
is going to contain a score that indicates the probability that current image belongs to one of the 10 classes. So if any of those 10 neurons in the output layer uh, have a particularly high value, then that is going to be the neural network saying, hey, I really think it's a shirt or a pair of pants or whatever it happens to be. So that is the neural network. We've constructed the layers for our neural, ne our neural network. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're going to go ahead and uh, compile the model. So let's go down here. That's really all we needed to do to build the neural network. So TensorFlow makes it really easy to do that. But before the model's ready for training, it needs a few settings. And these are going to be added during the model's compile step. So the three things we're going to add are a loss function, an optimizer, and metrics. And the way that we can do that in TensorFlow is we can say model.compile. And we're going to give it three things. The first one is an optimizer, and we'll just give it the atom optimizer, which is fairly standard. If you're not familiar with what an optimizer is supposed to do in a neural network, it's basically how the model is going to be updated based on the data it sees and the loss function that we give it. So it's going to, uh, the atom optimizer is pretty standard, so we're just going to stick with that. The loss function, which we can specify as loss, another argument in this function. And what we're going to do here is we're going to give it the sparse categorical cross entropy. And I guess the reason for choosing that might be a bit beyond the scope of this video, but just to explain a bit more on the loss function, this is really going to measure how accurate the model is during its training. And the general gist of what we want this loss function to do is we want to minimize the function uh, to kind of steer it or to point it in the right direction. So the smaller this loss function, uh, the smaller the value of this loss function, the better we are. Uh, the better we our, our model is actually doing it performing or predicting the data that it's supposed to try to predict. The last one is the metric. So the metric is used to monitor uh, the training and testing steps. And the following example that we're going to use is, is going to use the metric of accuracy. And that's generally the fraction of the images that were correctly classified. So we can specify that as metrics. It's going to take a list. You can, of course, specify other things in this list. We're only going to be concerned with accuracy, which you can do as either ACC or spell out the word accuracy compile this, the next step that we need to do is actually train the model. So training the neural network is going to require a couple steps. So the first step is to actually feed the training data into the model. And in this example, the training data, if we go back up to the top of the file, the training data is the train images in respective train, train labels. The next thing that we want to do is we want to figure out, well, the model essentially is now going to learn from that. And it's going to learn, hopefully, how to associate the images and the labels properly together and then after that, we're going to feed it the test data and say, or we're going to try it on the test data, I should say, and we're going to ask the model to make predictions on the test set. And then we're going to use, again, the test images and test labels that we have in the second pair of tuples there to verify whether or not the predictions are good. So if the network is able to verify the majority of the testing set, then that's definitely a positive thing. So. TensorFlow makes this very easy to do. The next thing that we're going to do is actually fit the model to the training data. So I'll go ahead and say model.fit, and then I'll give it the training images and the respective training labels. I'm also going to feed it in an optional parameter of epochs. I'm going to set it to five. So another thing that I recognize here is that I forgot a comma at the end of this layer. So make sure that you add that. I noticed that I have a typo here. This is Keras, not Kara. And then the other thing that I mentioned up here from the previous video is I commented these out, but we definitely don't want those commented out because we're trying to normalize this data precisely so that we can properly feed it into the neural network. So make sure that that's not commented out for you. Okay, so we, again, just to kind of review that, we normalize each of the pixels in every one of the arrays uh, just to 0, 1 black and white images so that we can feed it in. Uh, this is our model object that we're constructing here. The first layer is really only responsible for kind of reconstructing the data. It's stacking each of the two by two uh, arrays that represent the images into a 1D vector of 784 for each uh, for each element of the training set. The next dense layer is it has 128 neurons. And then the last one is the output layer, which has 10 neurons. And each of those is going to have some probability associated to it. And then the uh, whichever one has the highest probability of the output neurons is going to be the one that the neural network is like, oh, this is the one that I think it's associated to, where each of those neurons correspond to one of the elements of the class. The next thing we do is we actually compile the model. So we use the atom optimizer. We use a specific type of loss function. Uh, again, 
the, all of the different types of loss functions that you can use are probably well beyond the scope of this video. If you consult the TensorFlow documentation, you can check out what other loss functions are available and why you might want to use certain ones for certain um, for certain problems that you're working with, for certain types of data or certain types of problems that you're trying to use a neural network to solve. And then the metric that we're going to be using here is accuracy. Finally, we train the model, so we fit it against the training images and labels, and we train for a given number of epochs, which in this case is five. You can experiment with that parameter if you want to change it, but this just keeps it fairly concise, small, and hopefully uh, won't run for too long. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the terminal. I will say Python, and then I'll go ahead and say fashion mnist, and this will run it. So what we should see here is we should see the actual uh, training of the model. We'll see a warning, which uh, I don't think you have to worry about too much in this case. It's just letting us know that some of the TensorFlow stuff is deprecated and will be changing um, later. Right now we can see it's training for each of the respective epochs. We're on three of five, now four of five. We can see here the accuracy uh, parameter for each of the epochs. We can see that this is improving, 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 improving. And as we go down for each of these epochs, we get uh, accuracy that's progressively getting better and better and better. And right now we have a small loss function or a small-ish loss function, which is good. It's what we want. We want that to be as small as possible. And then we have a high accuracy or high enough accuracy around 89% or so. So that's good because that's uh, going to allow us to use this model to predict with around 89% accuracy according to what we see here. So let's go ahead and test the accuracy of our model on some of the elements of the testing set. We'll go ahead and do that now. So what we can do is we can say test underscore loss comma test accuracy is equal to model dot evaluate. So the object model that we've created from the Keras dot sequential has a method that's part of it, which is called evaluate. And you can give it a set of data and you can say, hey, using this model that we've created, that we've compiled, here's some uh, information that in this case, the model has not seen before. These are these have been obscured from the model. This will be the test images and the test labels. So given these two things, what is the accuracy that the model uh, can obtain with this data? So we can get both of those parameters there and let's just go ahead and see what the accuracy of this is. So we can say print test accuracy and then what this is gonna be, we'll make this a functional string. So I'll put an F there and then I'll go ahead and say colon and then in between these curly braces, I'll just put test ACC. So this is kind of a Python 3.6 plus thing. Uh, you can just print this out within the functional string within these braces if you have 3.6 plus. If not, you would have to do something like print uh, test accuracy and then something like, you know, test something like this. So anyway, I think it's a little bit cleaner with the above print statement and I'm running Python 3.6. So let me just go ahead and run this and we'll see what the accuracy is on the test data again, which is obscured. So unfortunately, we'll have to kind of watch it train again. Um, you know, we don't necessarily need to do that. We could have just commented that out, that out to save us a bit of time. This is especially important if you're running on uh, you know, a neural network that requires a substantial amount of time to actually train. So there's only five epochs here. It's not terribly long that we have to wait to see this actually do its thing. We see that it's getting about the same amount of accuracy. And then here, this last component here is the evaluate step where it's evaluated on the test images and test labels. So this is the uh, data that we obscured from it and it's getting about 87 plus percent accuracy on this test data, which is pretty good. So it's not perfect, but it's it's pretty darn good where it's able to predict with you know 87% what a given image is that has not seen before from this test set. So that's pretty much uh, all I wanted to do. I guess one, one thing we can, we can do just to go a little bit further is we can predict on, uh, we can also make predictions. So let's go ahead and do that because I think that's a relevant thing to do here. So let me comment out this. I'm actually going to comment out, uh, let's comment out that. Well, I'll keep that for now. Go down here. Okay, so one thing we can do is we can predict for an image. So I'll say predictions is equal to model.predict. Again, this is another function or a, me a method that is available to us from the model object that we created on line 32. And what I can do here is I can give it a list of data, which in this case is, again, the set of test images that we've obscured from our model. And what I want to do is I want to say, okay, predictions is going to be a list, and each of those components of the list is going to be a given prediction for any one of those elements of the list. So for instance, if I say predictions of zero, this is going to be what the model thinks the element zero is, so the first element of the testing set from the, um, the test images. So we feed in 
the or we train the model from before we feed it in the test images and we say hey I want you to make a prediction on this very first test image and that's what's given from this predictions of zero and we ask it what do you think this is so this is going to give us an array and the prediction is going to be an array of 10 numbers for those 10 output neurons and that's going to describe the confidence that the model has that any of those particular neurons or any of those particular classes correspond to uh, whatever the element the first element of the test images is. So what we can do then is we can say, okay, what's the one that has the highest output? What's the neuron that has the highest prediction probability of, you know, being that you think it actually corresponds to? So we can do np.argmax. All this is going to do is it's just going to take the maximum of all of the elements in a given NumPy array. And then basically it's where we want to feed it. What do you think the highest value is of predictions of zero? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out predictions of zero. Again, this will be a NumPy array of 10 items. And then what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to print out whatever the max one is. So what, do you, what does the network think that the first element is? So, and then just to verify that we've actually got the correct thing, I'll also go ahead and print out test labels of zero. So this is kind of us printing out the what we know the first element of the testing set to be. So test labels of zero is the actual part of the data that we've obscured, that label is what the thing actually corresponds to, and we want to see if the neural network is able to come up with the same thing. So let's go ahead and run this again. We're going to see the model train again. So we'll run this whole code. Hopefully we don't have any errors that we had in the later part of the code when we did all this. Again, we've seen this before. It's just kind of training. It takes a couple seconds. We'll see how well it does on this training set here. Or the same training set, but we'll just see how well it does for this particular uh, training session. So it's almost done us on the fifth epoch here. We see the accuracy is around the same as it was before, around 89% or so. It does this uh, same thing that we saw. Uh, so I, I guess I commented out the testing stuff, but I did put in this array. So this is a NumPy array where each of those 10 elements corresponds to the output of the 10 neurons of our neural network. And again, each of those is some probability, some weighting that the neural network is associating to what it thinks that element is. It is predicting that the element is a 9. So it says, okay, I think the neuron with the highest weight in this case is 9, which if I remember correctly, is an ankle boot. And in fact, the last 9 that we print out here is the actual label that we have obscured from our network so it doesn't know this it came up with that prediction on its own and it does agree with what it in fact actually is so the model did in fact predict that uh, predict that element correctly so that's pretty cool so we can you know you can also try it on the other elements of the testing set as well uh, you can play around with this you can change the number of epochs you can change the optimizer loss function things like that if you want to experiment with this more but i think this just kind of gives a nice overview of one how easy it is to use tensorflow to solve a very complicated problem that you would uh, you know programmatically need uh, well, I don't, I don't think it's very possible to do programmatically. Uh, so seeing how to do this using a method, a module like TensorFlow, I think is kind of neat. This is sort of the standard Hello World application in the land of neural networks. So I think it's good to just kind of see what is possible, how to do this, and to see how concise all of this is. So that's pretty much it for this video series. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the comment section below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.